as we were thinking about designing this event and what would be the theme this year, we settled on this idea of the new era of differentiation. And the new era is kind of like what's old is new again. In the old era, the products differentiated. And then the brand differentiated. And now we've seen pressure for price to be the differentiation. But the new era of differentiation is you and your teams with your lips moving. You own differentiation. The best story told the best is now what wins. Because so much of those other things we just talked about, price, brand, product, more or less the same, at least as people can perceive it. As soon as there's a difference, and they can perceive a difference, it's probably because one of you told a better story. So as we each share our content today, we're going to give you a piece of how to tell a better story. I'm going to talk about what it is you say. Neil's going to talk about what it is you do. Then we're going to hear about what it is you offer and how you package that. And then who you hire and the talent you bring on board. So that in this new era of differentiation, you're equipped, more equipped tomorrow afternoon than you were this morning to deal with it. Now, I have some news from the states, and, um, and that is that while sales is, is, is more in demand, Forrester just reported that by 2020, four years from now, there will be one million fewer sales jobs. So you might say, how can that be if sales is in such demand, but there's going to be a million fewer sales jobs? Well, Forrester identified four archetypes of salespeople, order takers, expediters, and finally, counselors. So there's three of those in there, the order takers, the expediters, and the navigators, those people who are into efficiency and helping customers get the things that the customer already knows they need. Those are where the losses are going to occur. But on the counselor archetype, it isn't going to be a loss. It isn't even going to be flat. It's going to gain. So that million loss, the million losses of sales jobs looks like three forms of salesmanship declining, one actually increasing. And that's what we're talking about today. So without further ado, I'm going to get into my content for today. My, my area of study is the area of sales conversations, actually what you say and why you say it. And I really stand on the shoulders of Neil Rackham. So I had an emotional moment over there when, when uh, Andy said Neil and Tim in the same breath. Because at one point, and I got permission from Neil to say this, the first book I read out of university in 1988 was Spin Selling. And um, that was Neil's first book, and that was the breakthrough book. And it really was the first time I saw somebody take a very research-oriented approach to the art of selling. And it is on those shoulders that I stand today to share some of my research, now three books later into it. Um, but it is kind of like um, I'm just going to have a moment in front of you that I'm sharing the stage with Neil Rackham now as his opening act. So the idea here is that salespeople with their lips moving has something to do with this guy right here. And what I learned about public speaking is that you should go to London, and the first story you should tell should be about an old American baseball player. Because <laughs> that would connect me to the audience right here. I figured Donald Trump had already been brought up, so I had nothing else to talk about. <laughs> so this is Babe Ruth, American baseball player, legend. He broke into the league in 1918, long time ago. He was a big man, so everybody believed he was going to hit a lot of home runs. He believed he was going to hit a lot of home runs, too. In order to hit those home runs as a big man, he thought of the laws of physics and said, I should use a big bat. So he used the biggest possible bat he could swing, 54 ounces. To give you a sense of why this is a big deal, the average baseball player was swinging a bat that was 37 ounces. So 54 ounces is a big bat, and now you have to realize this is back in an era when performance-enhancing drugs was beer. <laughs> so you're looking for any kind of edge you can find. So he figured big bat, you know, big guy, big home runs. And sure enough, the first year in the league, he led the league in home runs with 11. He led the league, so he was doing something right. Interestingly, though, as he progressed in his career, nine years later, he set a record for home runs of 60 in a single season. He had a 6x improvement over his first season. He was swinging a 40-ounce bat. There was a moment in his career where his best intentions, which was big guy, big bat, was interrupted by some science, where somebody said, it's not about bat size, it's about bat speed. 
And even though he was a winner with his 11 home runs, he led the league, he saw an opportunity to break through by doing something different and paying attention to what the science actually told him. So he had good intentions, but the wrong instincts. And this is one of the things I want to talk about in terms of salesmanship. I want to give you three ideas today about where maybe you and I have had good intentions, we've been told over the years to do certain things, but maybe they're not actually the right instincts. You might have been winning and having success with these things, just like he was, but maybe there's a breakthrough around the corner for you if we just take a look at some of the science and what it tells us. And maybe there's some of the traditions and truths that we hold dear that maybe we can disrupt a little bit today, and then you can leave with your teams and break through like Babe did. So I've identified three of those for us today. I'm going to talk about two of them in the morning, and then I'm coming back sort of as a teaser with one to finish off the afternoon. And these are the three good intentions of salespeople, I believe, and the wrong instincts of salespeople at the same time. The first good intention is that we should be hyper-responsive to the known stated needs of the customer, that we should be doing voice of the customer research and doing diagnostic discovery and identifying the needs they know about, and that should be the focus of our story, our conversations, and our solutions. Good intention, but maybe it's the wrong instinct. Second, we're going to talk about the idea of, is it always best to open with diagnostic questions, build rapport? establish and identify pain, or maybe there's another way to open that will create an even bigger breakthrough for you in terms of getting more people to see they need to do something different and want to choose you. And thirdly, we're going to talk about this idea of differentiation and the idea that we've learned for years that we should identify our USP, our unique selling proposition. And we should, uh, we should lead hard and lean into those things because this is what will distinguish us from the competitors. So if our customers see those differences, then they'll choose us. Great intention, right? But maybe, maybe it's the wrong instinct. Maybe there's a better way. So that's my promise to you. We're going to tackle each of these three today. In each case, there's going to be research to back um, these ideas up and concepts to share that you can take with you today. So here's where I'm going to start. I was working with a, a, a Fortune 50 technology company, and they recently did a post-mortem or an analysis of their sales won and lost. And they wanted to find out what did the losses have in common and what did the wins have in common. So Fortune 50 technology company, very prominent company, they went back and looked at about 70 million odd dollars of sales, wins and losses. And here's what they discovered on the loss side. When they lost deals, the most common reason that the customer gave for giving the business to someone else was that they chose on price. And so our, our client at the time said, well, of course they did. We're the more expensive company. They chose on price. That's why they chose our cheap competitor over there. That's why we lost the business. See, it wasn't my problem as a salesperson. It was our pricing. That was the problem. So then they looked at the wins and they asked the customers, when, when, when you chose this firm, why did you choose this firm? What was your main criteria? The answer was price. True story. Now they had a challenge because apparently they win on price and lose on price. So they did an analysis and said, over here are we just bad negotiators that we won because we gave away all our profits? And they discovered that was not the case. It was not the case at all that in fact they were protecting their margins, but the customer believed they were the highest value provider. So how can you lose on price and win on price? They had to dig a layer deeper. And here's what they discovered. When they lost on price, they asked the customer, what were your primary criteria for choosing? Like what were your considerations? What major needs were you solving for? And on average, the people who they lost, the customers they lost, were making choices based on two to three criteria or needs or considerations. This is where it got interesting. When they won, customers on average could articulate four to six. So at some point, price was a challenge when you responded to the things that the customers told you. Price became value when you told a bigger story and you told a better story. That's what I wanted to dig in. When I saw that, it's like, what is going on here? Because at some point, aren't we doing everything right? If we ask a customer, what do you need? What are your problems? What are your threats? What are your challenges? What are you struggling with today? And they identify some needs. 
And then we do the happy dance. We go, hey, we got some needs. Let's link that to some of our capabilities. And you put a need with a capability, and you have a solution. You have a value prop. Now we got a story, right? That makes all the sense in the world. This is what we've been told. If we do this, we're doing it right. But I'm going to offer that potentially if we do this, we're actually creating a commoditized conversation. Because asking customers what their problems are is not differentiation. That's having a list of questions to ask them what their problems are, them telling you what their problems are. Voice of the customer research, no longer differentiation. Is it any wonder that when you go in with a pitch and a competitor goes in with a pitch, you're both articulating against the same business problems because you both ask the same questions? And then you've mapped them to your capabilities, which today, when many companies look alike and your products and portfolios are sort of similar, you're mapping similar solutions and your story starts sounding alike. So this is sort of a red box area. It's sort of a don't want to go there because that's where the conversation is going to sound a lot like everybody else. So what do people do in this moment? What's your go-to move when you're like, uh-oh, we're going to get red boxed. We're going to get put in the commodity box. Well, what I see most companies do is say, hmm, you know what we should do? We should introduce our value-added services. Does that ring a bell for anybody? You're like, hey, there's some things out here that the customer's not fully appreciating in the story over there. So if we need to distinguish ourselves, let's tell them about you know, this capability. And let's tell them about this capability. Let's bring this into the story. And we'll call them value-added services, which is a good intention. But it might just be the wrong instinct. Because the research that's out there calls this choice overload. The ironic part is you and I call this value-added services. And we build our pitches. And we stand up there and say, we've got value-added services. And they make us different. And the customer hears something else. They hear, well, that's why you cost so much more. If maybe you peeled a few of those things out, we might be able to keep talking. Or that's where complexity shows up. Things that my, I might not use or things my people have to learn that I might not even really need just creates more failure points and complexity and potential struggles. So I'm not hearing value-added services. There's a, a translation or a filter going on. When you say value-added services, I hear costs and complexity as a customer. And you wonder why your story isn't getting more traction, because your services are so value-added. This is why. So what we've discovered was really going on in that story, that four to six versus two to three needs, is that the best, most successful salespeople we're introducing problems, introducing needs that people hadn't even considered. They are the unconsidered needs. They are the things that the customer didn't see coming. They are the things that the customer maybe saw coming, but they didn't appreciate the size and speed with which those were coming. Or maybe they had created so many workarounds in the past that they had hidden it. When you revealed that, they now saw, wow, I can't get there from here. When you calculated the size and the speed of it, they're like, wow, I should care about that now. Or when you introduce them to the thing they'd never seen before, they're like, that has to be on the list. You're right. So the salesperson who was able to introduce an unconsidered need, actually introduce something the customer didn't tell you, is possibly the salesperson who changes the discussion on price, introduces an unconsidered need that then and then and only then causes the customer to care about that capability you tried to call value add. So we think this is where the story is going, that the opportunity to still win on price isn't about going in there and lowering your price. The opportunity to win on price is to tell a better story. And the better story lives in the unconsidered need, not just responding to repeating the known need. Trusted advisors introduce the thing that they didn't see coming. The one who tells them what they already told you is a tape recorder. You follow me on that? I mean, at some point, I'm not a consultative seller. If I simply told you what you told me, that means I'm just an excellent scribe. But at some point, if I tell you something you didn't know, or I reveal something that you had hidden, or I help put into perspective the magnitude of a challenge or threat so that you understand when and where and how you need to deal with it, now I'm adding some value. Now I'm a trusted advisor. Now I'm actually consultative. So we think the real opportunity to create urgency and uniqueness lives out here. Urgency, 
Because in the red box, which is interesting, if a customer tells you, I've got these problems, and you repeat those problems back to them, and you say, and here's my solution, you're expecting the customer to go, yes, I have got to do that. But how many times does the customer say, thank you very much? We'll think about that. At what percentage do your customers just keep doing the same thing, even though you told them they had, you know, these are your problems? And then you come in and say, we've identified your problems, and here's our solution for those problems. And you come in there, and you've got a solution. You're pretty excited. And the customer goes, you know, you're right. I've got some problems. I've got some struggles. But that thing over there that you're introducing to me, that's not a solution. That's a change management project. These things here, they're a problem, but I'm not dead yet. That thing there, that could kill me. So there's an element of us walking in with a so-called solution to the known problems, and the customer starts seeing bigger problems associated with our solution than the things they're living with. It is only until you get to the unconsidered needs, the thing they didn't expect, the thing they didn't know coming, where all of a sudden that starts to look like medicine. That looks like an antidote. That looks like something I require. Because even though these problems I know might not kill me, those unknown ones could. I don't know. So the real opportunity to tell a story lives here in terms of urgency, but also uniqueness. You get a chance to introduce your capabilities. So here's my little sort of litmus test for you today, is that if you have value-added services that have not added value to your prop value propositions, follow me, and customers don't care enough, maybe reverse engineer that into something they do care about, a need, a challenge, a threat, a problem, a missed opportunity that they need to know, they need to believe, and you need to construct a story around with credible evidence as a reality they must deal with, and then they will care about that value-added service. The problem is that we've been solving people's problems when we should maybe be selling them problems that they didn't realize. Not making them up, but helping them see these things they didn't know. So I've done some tests on this. These are my partners at Stanford University, Dr. Zachary Tormala and Dr. Margaret Neal. Zachary Tormala is an expert in persuasion. I didn't even know that you could get a PhD in persuasion, but apparently that is a thing. I never meet with him live and in person because I don't want to look him in the eyes. I don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't trust that guy. One time I told him, I bet you you never, ever lose an argument with your wife. And he said, well, we never argue. And I said, precisely. Margaret Neal is an expert in negotiations and teamwork. And we together have collaborated to understand some of these things. So we put this unconsidered need idea to the test. And we did a little test where we created four pitches. And these four pitches were constructed like this. The first pitch was one that was based on responding to your stated needs, and then talking about our solution, and then credentialing our company. The second pitch was responding to your stated needs, and credentialing our company, and then telling you about our value-added services. The third pitch structure was the idea of responding to your stated needs, but then telling you something you didn't know. And then the fourth approach was telling you something you didn't know before we ever dove into the things you told us, the unconsidered need introduced first. We don't have time to walk through the whole study with you, but um, we can send that to you if you'd like. But there were four pitch conditions for the same product and service, just structured differently. And we put 400 people through this test, and we wanted to find out which one would create the most differentiation, right? Which one would be unique, because that's what we're all looking for. These are the results that I can share from the unconsidered need test. If you are willing to introduce something the customer didn't tell you, an unconsidered need, you can improve your uniqueness, the perception of being different, by 50%. If you're struggling with being commoditized, put in parity, not seen as different as from your competitors, introduce something the customer didn't tell you. Because the, telling them what they told you is not distinguishing you. Because everybody's doing that. So look at this. The standard solution, which was respond to the stated needs and credential yourself, was scientifically and statistically no different than value-added solution condition. It wasn't until you told them something they didn't know that people started going, wow, OK, this is different. This is unique. And that is our goal, right? Well, it's part of our goal. The second part of our goal is to improve the perception of our institution, our organization, our products and services, and their quality level. Distinguish ourselves quality-wise, right? 
you can get over a 10% bump in the perception of quality when people looked at it and analyzed it and said, this is a higher quality company and their solutions are higher quality if you introduce an unconsidered need. If you don't, you are statistically no different than any other presentation style or any other competitor. But what got interesting here is the perception of quality, the only statistical difference was when you introduced the unconsidered need first. By the time you introduced it last, you would lost the impact of it because the perception was the customer was certain they already knew who you were and what you were saying and certain you were like everybody else before you got to the thing that made them a little unexpected and uncertain. And that's the power of persuasion, as you'll see right here. We ask then questions about attitude and choice and preference, willingness to pay more. Which of these vendors would you choose? And look at that. You can gain, and I'll take this, in a commodity market, I'll take a 10% edge any day. You can gain a 10% edge in people's willingness to choose you over somebody else by introducing an unconsidered need first. In other words, the first thing that you tell a customer when you get in there is something they maybe didn't know and expect because the opportunity for urgency and the opportunity to then connect that to something you do uniquely is done at the main moment where they're ready to hear something new and different. Imagine hearing the same pitch over and over from competitors telling you back to you the same things you told them and start to imagine how that starts to feel and how that starts to sound. And then somebody comes in and tells you something you didn't know. The power of the unconsidered need. I give you that as a, as a tool today and I want you to think about tomorrow, literally tomorrow afternoon, if you have to structure a hot opening to a presentation or a proposal, or some other engagement with the customer. Think about this. Uh, unconsidered need is the product of an unknown strength that you have that has previously been projected as a value-added service, but they don't perceive the value of it. Linking that to a need, that a problem, a challenge, a threat, a missed opportunity they didn't even know, and then framing that in a surprising piece of data that helps somebody realize something different is going on and that this is valid and supported. You don't tell the story this way, you only construct the story this way. You tell the story this way. You tell the story by introducing that surprising piece of data that gets the customer to go, hmm, a million sales losses. And then you give them the unconsidered need, which is that Three of the four forms of sales are failing and will lose see losses, but one of them will succeed, and it's the professional consultative type seller. And then the opportunity, the new strength, is that there's development to help salespeople get there. So in a way, my opening was designed to do this. Tell you the story of the fact that sales jobs are going away. The new need is there's one form of salesperson that's going to make it, and they're going to thrive the opportunities to be part of this session and part of this organization to help make sure your teams get there. But if you just follow this little formula, it's just a simple tool. I don't want to make it too complicated because if something's too complicated, we all have an excuse for not doing it. Just to help you out and think differently tomorrow. How can you be different? How can you improve your perception of quality? And how can you be more persuasive? Tell them something they didn't know about a problem or opportunity they didn't know they had and do it first. Dr. Tormala says it's really important that you do it this way because persuasion does not take place until uncertainty is introduced into the conversation. Human beings' natural desire is to resolve everything to certainty. We love to live in certainty. We like our status quo, our current situation, to be safe and secure. And anything that might look a little bit different and challenging, we try to resolve the certainty. We try, to, we try to make our preferences stable. And all day long, your customers are doing that. And if you just come in and say the same thing as everybody else, you're going to resolve them to certainty, and you've eliminated the opportunity to create persuasive moments. Uncertainty and, unex and, and unexpected is at the heart of, un uh, of persuasion, but only if you do it first. So, I don't know about you, but I believe it's a good intention to want to respond to the known, stated, identified customer needs as a way of launching into our presentations. But it might be a wrong instinct. 
Instead, if you want to distinguish yourself, create urgency and differentiation, maybe you need to introduce an unconsidered need first. And the scientific principle associated with that is something called the uncertainty principle. Persuasion is not really found unless there's some uncertainty. One good intention, now a new approach to it. So the second one here, diagnostic questions. Big fan of SPIN, and I think SPIN is very relevant today because it's not open-ended diagnostic questions. It's much more scientific and methodical than that, and I'm going to give that to the man who invented it. He'll talk about that later. But I'm talking about that list that you've been given to say, ask people what's keeping them up at night. Ask them this question. Ask them that question. Probe for pain. And just ask open-ended assessment questions, trying to discover if there's something you can solve. And hopefully they'll tell you, because if they tell you, then they own that pain. That's the assumption. That's what we've been told for all these years. That's the good intention. I should ask them questions. We've been told to diagnose before we prescribe. We've been told we have two ears and one mouth. Use it in that proportion. But is it possible that was all good advice, but it had really no scientific underpinnings in terms of how people actually react? Part of the reason that we believe that is if you ask customers, how would you like a salesperson to interact with you, they might tell you, I would like them to ask questions about me. Because that is how they feel they should ask, act, and that is how they feel maybe that should go. But the reality is, and we're about to test this, is that if everybody does it, it's no longer different. And if everybody does it, the customer starts to wonder, well, what's in it for them? I'm now helping you sell me. I really don't see the quid pro quo in this. And maybe for the order taker, the expediter, and the navigator, that's fine, but not the counselor. So let's, let's just test this for a second here. So I want you to imagine for a second that you're not in sales at all. You now work for marketing. I know, now that's painful. That's a moment right here where you're like, oh, wow, I just went to the dark side. But you work for marketing, and your job in marketing is to create a brand, generate demand, and train and equip salespeople. And now, a salesperson comes to you to sell some form of automation, marketing automation, sales automation, and the like. And they ask you, as a head of marketing, hey, what percentage of the messaging and the content and the campaigns that you create for salespeople, do you think they actually use? Now, this is your hard work. You've put a lot of time and effort into it, used a lot of resources to create this stuff. I'd love to know, like, what percentage of it do you think goes used or unused? And you ask in an open-ended question, and maybe even infer, there's been some concern that some stuff that marketing creates is not getting used in the field as intended. But I want to know what percentage you think of your stuff the salespeople use. What do you think generally might be a reaction if I say on a scale of 0% to 100%, what might be a chief marketing officer's response? Are they going to be like, oh yeah, I'm just going to tell you I suck? Do you think, is that a British word or is that just American? I don't know. If I, if I, I have four daughters at home, I'm not allowed to use that word, so this is a big day for me. Um, <laughs> be surprised how I have to talk at home. Um, we can't say fart at home, I have to say fluff. Um, <laughs> now you see where I'm coming from. So suck is a big deal. So anyways, I, I, if I ask you as a CMO how much of your stuff doesn't get used, what am I sort of asking them to do? I'm asking them to admit what? Maybe how bad they are, right? How, how their stuff doesn't work. If you really think about it, what, and that, so give me a range. What do you think a CMO might be willing to admit if you walk in with an open-ended diagnostic question saying, how much of your stuff? What do you think? Give me a range. 60, 70%. 70% so is getting used or not used? Getting used. Yes, yeah, 70%. Anybody think maybe even a little higher? Could be 80%. Here's what I think is going to happen. I'm not perfect, right? I'm going to give you that. Uh, we, we're not perfect here at XYZ Corporation. Nobody is. But I would believe, I would have to say that maybe 80% of what, what I built gets used. And I'm going to give you the fact that there's probably 20% that goes unused in the sales force. Maybe we've missed the mark, or salespeople are too stupid to find it. 
So that might be how it goes. Now, now I want you to imagine that conversation, because that seems, I'm just asking you some questions, right? Maybe even told you this isn't going perfectly. How's it going with you? Now, imagine if I came and told you this. Hey, um, there's some research from industry organizations, Serious Decisions, and the American Marketing Association that have identified that on average, 70 to 90% of the content that sales marketing creates in the name of sales support goes unused. They've documented this. They looked at the last 12 months of downloads from sales portals and discovered that 70 to 90% goes unused. Crazy numbers. So I want to ask you, in light of that, how do you think you guys are doing? You know, where, where do you think you're at? So what happens at that moment after I've just given them that statistic from a third party and then ask them for their opinion? What do you think changes or what do you think doesn't change? What happens? What might they be willing to admit at this point? How bad off are they or how good are they? Do you think it changes? In which direction? That they start to be more willing to admit that maybe there's a higher percentage that goes unused. The science behind this is this idea that um, I'm willing to admit I'm broken if I can still be better. I'm better, but still broken. So maybe we have a conversation here. Maybe we have a conversation. Because at least I'm better than a lot of people. But all of a sudden, my answer came up differently, even though really, arguably, it was the same circumstance. So let's talk about what's going on here from a scientific perspective. It's called the anchoring effect, if you've heard of it. And it can be used a lot of times with pricing, but it can be used with information as well. Here's the opportunity. You go in and ask them, where are you struggling? Tell me how bad off it is. Tell me how you suck. I mean, that's really, if you think about it, really, how much pain are you in? How, 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 how poorly have you made decisions? That's kind of, if you think about it, what we're trying to get them to say. And all along, they're going to be trying to figure out, what should I answer here that doesn't put me in a bad position? Because they're a little defensive. Or you come in and share an insight, third party validated, that anchors them in a place where now they have the opportunity to respond in light of that circumstance. That's the, that's the proposition. So if you ask them first to tell you where they're struggling, they're going to probably lowball you to save a little bit of face, right? And if you think about what's really going on, is this. If, let me take that off the screen for a second. If you think about it, if I ask you what your number is, and you tell me only 20% gets unused, and then I give you that statistic, well, there's industry research that says it's 70 to 90%, what happens then? They get defensive. They're like, they're like um, no, that data could be wrong. Are you serious? We're, that's crazy, because now they gotta defend their number, because now they look like a liar. So the idea of using the data after the question, which maybe seems intuitively right and sounds like a good intention, now actually puts them under defensive. The other problem you risk is they go, wow, I must be doing OK. Thanks for the meeting. <laughs> go find some other sucker who's sucking. <laughs> All right, so the, 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 the challenge is that if you bring the data up afterward, it isn't like you now move them like, oh, you're right. I confess, I really have not been that good. No, at that moment, they either have hubris that says, well, that, that, I'm glad I had that confirmed, or you must be crazy. Either way, that's not a good discussion. So imagine you give them the piece of insight. They can admit, here's a number. They're still better than many people, but they're still broken enough to need the help. And it is in there that they admit that they need help, but they can save their face. And you've accomplished the anchoring effect. We've done some studies on this. The second study, do you want to see that again? I saw people taking pictures of it. Just wait. One, two, three, now. <laughs> um, the study that we did on this goes something like this. If you ask open-ended questions and then ask somebody how they feel, they give you one answer. If you share an interesting piece of data that gives them an anchor about how they could be feeling, you can make a significant impact. We did a very conservative study talking about vitamin D intake, which you don't get a lot of here in London. Um, <laughs> I'm from Wisconsin, we get none. Um, but we saw a, a material significant drop in confidence levels, people more willing to admit they're not doing as well as they could, 
when we shared the insight and then asked the questions about how they're doing versus when we asked the questions and then eventually shared the insight. So there can be a, there's a material drop in confidence. And I'm not saying manipulate. I'm not saying, I'm saying this is data you would have shared anyways. Maybe you just flip that. Because you want to walk around and be trustworthy, a trusted advisor and consultative, so you've got some of these statistics in your back pocket to improve the dialogue. Maybe you should lead with that versus following with that. If you want to improve the power of persuasion and the ability to move somebody off of their current situation and increase the probability that they're going to favor you in the future dialogue. But then we went and asked something else. We then offered, basically in this study, we were going to sell them three different products to help cure their vitamin D deficiencies. We literally had these people believing there was something they could buy at the end. And we then said, we ask about half a dozen behavioral intention questions about willingness to buy and tell them we'd take them to a potentially an order screen, right? And then we put the group who was over here in the questions, then the insight, and found out how persuadable they were and we took the group that had heard the insight first and then answered the questions and found out how much more interested or not they were in the products. Does that make sense so far? So we divided the group up. This is what we saw. Because we found some interesting results, we created a third control group, a third control group, where we simply just gave them the insight and information first and then asked them if they'd be willing to try some new products that would fix that. So you follow me? We didn't ask any diagnostic questions. And there was no statistical significance in persuadability between the group that just got the information and insight and then was asked if they'd be willing to buy some new products versus those who were asked some open-ended diagnostic questions, then given the insight, and then asked if they'd buy something. So in other words, starting with diagnostic questions open-ended and then sharing an insight didn't make anyone more open to being persuaded than just telling them the insight. The only time questions made a difference, and they did make a difference, is when you, asked the inf you gave them the information, then asked the questions, and then found out if they'd be willing to do something about it. So the power of questions still exists, but they're more powerful after the anchoring effect. Not only are they more powerful from the perspective of anchoring them in a place to need to be better, they're actually anchoring them in a place where then they're more open to the solution for that. Because we literally had them believing they could buy something at the end of this. So there's an opportunity here. If you really think about your best intentions as salespeople, as sales leaders, that you should go in there with a list of diagnostic questions probing for pain, hoping to find something, hoping to land on something that you can actually do something about, maybe that's a good intention and not exactly the right instinct. You can be successful with it, just like Babe Ruth was, but maybe you could be more successful in a breakthrough sort of way if you were willing to I think of the idea of launching some information and insights to anchor them before you ask the questions, known as the anchoring effect. So the thing I wanted to talk about today was this idea that there's ways you're doing it that can appear successful, but maybe things are changing, and maybe it's science that can help you get to the breakthrough. Just like bat size was not the breakthrough that bat speed was, hopefully some of these ideas I've given you here this morning will do the same for you. So this is the tease. I've got this afternoon an opportunity to talk to you about leading with and identifying your most differentiated capabilities and whether that's best. And within that, I'm going to talk about a new study we just completed that asked executive decision makers whether they were rational or emotional deciders. And then we put them through a test to find out if they really knew the truth about themselves. It's going to be fascinating, and I'm promising that for you this afternoon. So more to come this afternoon. But I hope this morning we've got you off to a rock and start here now. Maybe some ideas that disrupt your current thinking and good intentions, recognizing that maybe your instincts are a little off and there are new opportunities for you moving forward. I'll talk to you more later this afternoon. Thank you.